Hey everybody, brothers and sisters. It's kind of a gloomy day, but the light of Jesus has gone out into the world and it is still shining. So, um, I just love, I just love walking by the Spirit and today is Friday the 12th. So, um, I've had several days of really spending a lot of time with God, uh, a lot of time um, reaching out to other um, brothers, I guess, other brothers and other ministries to see if I, you know, to see if I've got things wrong. Um, I've had a lot of people um, questioning my uh, position on, um, on remarriage. And a lot of people are like, you know, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that um, over the last 50 years, um, the church has no longer stood for what God has said about marriage. That it is one man and one woman for life until death do you part. And, and the problem is, and I've been personally greatly affected by this, but the problem is everybody's families. Are being affected by this um, you know children and in fact uh, one of the ministries that I um, reached out to um, and they email you back and everything too um, I, I, I'm seeing a lot of people that are you know I've been doing this for, I've been doing this for 12 years when I first um, was doing it it you know John Piper <laughs> he was like the the one right and he was going out on a limb um but now there are a lot of different people and i think i've added i don't know uh, maybe six or seven videos to my playlist does my playlist have very many people that have watched it no um because it this this permanence of marriage position is so radical to today's society it's, it's radical to people who've been to seminary. It's radical to um, Christian counselors. It's, it's so radical, even though it's such, it's such a big deal to God because he created marriage and he said any sex outside of that one covenant marriage is adultery. And it's not just something that you say you're sorry for and get into heaven. Um, it's not the unforgivable sin. Don't get me wrong. It's the forgivable sin to be um, to commit adultery, fornication, um, lust, uh, homosexuality. All of that is forgiven. But it's not forgiven to keep on doing it. And that's where I'm having a, a lot of pushback. Um, you know, people will say, well, of course, if someone is um, in remarriage and it is, I mean, even these people that are, are seeing what the Bible has to say. And I, I, another reason why this is so important is um, John the Baptist was beheaded for this. Okay. Um, he said that, Herod and Herodias were illegally married and he got killed for it. Now, if, if John had had it wrong and that divorce and remarriage was okay, I'm sure that Jesus would have told him, John, you, excuse me, John, hey, John, um, just tell them that, that all they've got to do is say they're sorry and then you can get out of jail and you won't be killed. But that's not what Jesus did. And, and really, when you hear the story of John the Baptist and how Jesus allowed the man that he said was the best of, of men, that he allowed John the Baptist to be beheaded, um, you know, you got to take this seriously. So, um, yes, my family has been uh, particularly hard hit by this i am the first um divorce in either side of uh you know my husband and and my family uh we're the first divorce i know a lot of y'all are you know, dealing with divorce multi-generational divorce 
Um, and it's not, it's not the divorce as much as it is the remarriage. Um, you know, in Mark and Luke, Jesus said that if you divorce and remarry, it's adultery. He didn't say that the divorce was the adultery. Um, so, uh, in one, of, and then another, re, you know, and I, probably a lot of y'all have already left, left and said, bye, Terry's not talking about something that I'm interested in. But I, I would just encourage you that um, this is a morality issue. And every born-again believer in Christ needs to be concerned not just about um, um, the first two of the Ten Commandments. We need to be concerned about the moral law, which has not gone away. And it's the moral law that is the most effective in evangelism, in witnessing. So, um, and you know, I, I hurt for people because um, I know the pain that it causes and I know that it causes a lot of y'all pain. And I know those parents who see their kids um, going through divorces of their own or kids who are saying, I'm not getting married, I'm just going to um, sleep around or sleep with, you know, have sex outside of marriage, fornication, or I'm going to live with a person. Uh, you know, for a Bible-believing, born-again Christian, that is really, really hard to see um, your child doing that. Um, and uh, I heard the statistic that three out of four children who experience divorce as a child will also divorce. 75% is just, it's just really sad. And yes, I do believe that um, the rapture is about to happen. And, um, you know, I do see, uh, I, I'm watching the watchmen. I'm watching them. I haven't, uh, wa today I haven't watched anybody's video. Well, today since the morning, uh, the regular morning started. I haven't watched anybody's videos, so um, I don't really know what's going on, um, except um, I, when I got in the car to go visit uh, the pregnant women down at the hospital, when I got in the car, there was, I don't normally listen to the, um, to the radio, but when I turned on the radio on Victory Channel, there was a sermon talking about that we... Christians need to think about Jesus in both ways in that he was the suffering servant for our sins, that he died for you personally. He died, if you had been the only one, he died for you. And that your sins that he died for, he wants you to give them up. He wants you to repent and stop sinning. Um... And then also to think about Jesus. Yes, we look forward to um, when we see him in the clouds. I mean, this was I mean, this was within a minute, maybe forty-five seconds of me turning on the radio that he's talking about the rapture. But he said, you know, just imagining he was here as a suffering servant, but now he is king, and he is in power, and that he's going to be meeting us in the clouds. So, um, so. So I have, I'm, I'm going to continue to have until, until the rapture happens, I'm going to have that continuing, um, yes, I want to think about what it's going to be like to be in heaven, but I also am thinking about what needs to still be done, that the workers are few and that people are still getting saved. Yes, yes, people are still getting saved. But what do we have to lose? We don't have anything to lose to tell them to repent, to point out their sins and tell them to repent. And really, by walking by the Holy Spirit, maybe there's somebody that God wants you to tell them to repent that um, you didn't realize that they were in this sin until recently, you know? Um, you know, when, when the Holy Spirit tells you that someone is in a sin, 
that could cause them to not make it in the rapture, you have to. The faster you can tell them and ask them to repent, the better. And that may even be that you've got to um, be like Nathan. Um, Nathan, Nathaniel, Na whatever. Um, it was Nathan, right? Nathan came to um, to Daniel and told him um, that he was guilty of adultery. So um, the reason why this is important, a lot of people, I don't believe in once saved, always saved. Um, uh, in fact, if you want to have a good detailed uh, answer for that, um, I was looking at the book Eternal Security by Charles Stanley. I live in Atlanta. Charles Stanley and Andy Stanley are the two um, big once saved, always saved um, teachers. But if you go into Amazon and you look up Eternal Security and then you just look at the one star reviews for that book, there's a guy's, um, there's a guy's uh, very, very thorough and detailed um, uh, uh, review that goes through the Bible by chapter of the book to explain all the scriptures that uh, are in conflict with what Charles Stanley teaches. Um, so, oh, so the thing is when, if God sends you to tell some, if God reveals to you that someone's in sin, and I've had this happen a lot over, over my uh, Christian walk, and you know, maybe it is just that this is my function in the body, it probably is, um, but when I, I can't, I can't not tell them. I try, I try. I'm like, I try to do it really gently. I try to ask them questions to make them think about it. It's kind of like, I don't think I've had very many um, people watch. Uh, I did a video on just asking questions to determine whether you're born again. I've done videos on, um, you know, are you born again? Are you, you know, are you going to examine yourself to see if you're ready for the rapture? Um, I don't, they don't get very many people that watch that. Well, I think a lot of it is that people think that they're all good to go. And uh, I have to keep asking myself, God, am I going to be ready? Am I going to be worthy? Am I, you know, the scariest thing is recently, um, you know, he had brought someone's sin to my attention and I was trying to gently tell them without, um, without, you know, hoping that they would come to it on their own. Um, but I, you know, at a certain point, I realized I was being a hypocrite because I love this person and I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to see him hurting. But the, the, the truth is, and, and, you know, uh, Vody Bacham's sermon on brokenness is one of my favorite sermons but the truth is just like if you love a child you, you you can tell them where they've gone wrong and what they've done wrong but then um you gotta step back and you gotta let god work on them you know he he says he disciplines those he loves he says that he'll be a father to the fatherless but he, you know the Holy Spirit convicts people of their sin, and then you can't be running in and saying, oh, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You have to step back, and you have to let God work on them. And it's painful, and it's painful to see your 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 loved one hurting. Um, but it's also painful to then look at yourself and think, you know, being a hypocrite is a very serious thing. So if I've been preaching and teaching uh, about a sin, um, which God has shown me that I had, and then he gave me um, the freedom from it to forsake it, and, and the joy that comes from being finished with it, um, if I see it, and uh, because I love somebody, I decide I'm not gonna say anything, I'm a hypocrite, and being a hypocrite, if you look it up in the Bible, um, first of all, Romans 12, um, 12, 9, love must be without hypocrisy, hate evil, cling to what is good. 
Um, God cares a lot about morality. He didn't come to do away with morality. He actually came to fulfill it and to bump up. God, God, Jesus gave, gave what God's standards are. And it's, it's a higher standard than just the Ten Commandments. It is. Um, you read the Sermon on the Mount. It, over and over, Jesus was raising up the bar. Um, so I don't want to be a hypocrite. And um, I, have, I have spent a lot of time counseling people um, to avoid looking the other way uh, on people's sin. And the reason why is that a lot of people will say, oh, you know, um, there are certain sins that, that God forgives and it's okay to keep on doing them. They'll say that, such as uh, adultery. They'll say, well, you know, that person struggles with it. Well, they're, you know, <laughs> at a certain point, they've got to give it up. You know, that's the problem with the church is they'll, they let everybody just keep on struggling, keep on struggling without having any victory. And maybe it's because they keep on saying, oh, there, 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 it's okay, when it's not okay. And, and, and I don't want to be responsible for anybody being left here because I did not have the courage to say it's not okay. I need, I, I want... I want, you know, I'm trying to encourage everybody to have the courage, encourage, courage, to have the courage. You know, if God tells you to do something, don't lean on your own understanding. Just do it. Just do it. And, and it feels so good just to do it. If you keep trying not to feel good uh, and not to do it, you won't feel good. Um... And just don't lean on your understanding and just let God work on them. You deliver the message. You do it in love. You're, you're just saying, hey, God, God has brought this to my attention. And then you show them verses that would explain what the problem is. And then you pray and you pray and you let it up, let it up to God. And if you see them hurting, you still think about 1 Corinthians 5. Okay, church discipline. Well, that God was, you know, Paul was saying, hey, God is mad that you're accepting this, um, this person in your presence who is a, who, now we're not supposed to judge the world, but if this person says they're a Christian and they're living in idolatry, they're living in sexual immorality, adultery, um, I forgot what the other things are. So read 1 Corinthians 5, but Put that person in your life um, who says they're a Christian but doesn't live differently from the world and, and think about it. Hey, is God mad at me that I keep looking the other way just because I want to keep the peace? We are not peacekeepers. We are we're radical. We're radical, and we're not peacekeepers. We're peacemakers, and the way to make peace is to point out sin and to um, let God make the peace. In fact, there's a, a scripture that says, if you see someone sinning in a way that does not lead to death, then you're supposed to pray for them. So that would be for um, disputable matters, Um uh, you know, maybe they, you know, maybe they've got an, they, they get angry at somebody and they don't, um, you know, we're commanded to not let the sun uh, go down on our anger, you know, those kind of things. But when you see, it says, but if you see someone sinning in a way that does lead to death, I'm saying, I'm not saying that you should pray about that. So do you know which sins lead to death? You know, if you're going to witness, you've got to know these things. You've got to know what makes that person a dead man walking. The world is full of dead men walking, but there are also 
so-called Christians and a lot of them that are still dead men walking. So what is the sin that's causing them to be dead? Um, Revelation 21, 8. You know, I'm, I'm looking at myself because I don't want to be a hypocrite. How many times have I said, um, hey, I don't want to be an idolater. I don't want to be a coward. I don't want to be a liar. Um, I don't want to be in sexual immorality. There are eight different ones. Unbeliever, witchcraft. Uh, can't remember what the other two are. Maybe it's adultery and homosexuality. That I think that's in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Um, anyway, I think of how many people are believers but cowards. Think of how many people are believers but liars. Think of how many people are believers but adulterers. Um, they go to the lake of fire right we, once we once we are out of here once we're raptured and yes yes i'm excited i'm excited about going i see some incredible dates that we're looking at and super moons as i've got on my moonstone yeah uh yeah super moon uh the super moon blue moon blood moon yes i mean i see these things but I know, I know a lot of y'all are in the same boat I'm in. We want to go. We long to go. But we are grieving for those who just don't seem to get it. And we can't, once we're gone, there's nothing that we can do. Right? Um, so, uh, so, I'll end it there. And then I'm going to talk about what God did in the middle of the night. And how uh, how he was speaking to me. All right, love y'all, and you know, just keep on thinking, asking God, "Am I a hypocrite?" Because somewhere it says um, it says, well, in Matthew twenty three, there are seven woes to the hypocrites. Jesus is like whoa, w o e, not like whoa. Wait a minute, he's like whoa, like judgment. On the hypocrites and somewhere it says that these people go to the place of the hypocrites where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth um, yeah I'll leave it there all right love y'all God bless you